with that. I forgot something very important. Intros. I'm Ralph. I am currently the, uh, the, the, uh, the president. I warned them, don't elect me president. I will stir things up. So I started with the B part. Uh, KE5 HDF. And that's Mark down there who's busy. <coughs> yes. Oh. I'm the treasurer and secretary. We just will have a treasurer report and, and whatnot here. I keep yeah. getting confused. Is it KB or WB? WB. WB5 AM. Mark Landry. Oh, we got sort of an infinite loop going on here. <laughs> Camera and center. Here you go. That's like a barber like shop. That's like a barber shop. shop. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many reflections do you see, right? <clears throat> and you, sir? Ken Wenzel, KW5KEDN. Uh, W2WX, Stephen. He's our uh, parts on the air kind of guy. I'm Rusty Wilson. I'm w, WD8 JJR. I haven't said that in ages. <laughs> <laughs> that was your dad's call sign? It was. I'm glad you're able to get it back. Harry Basile, KG5IRR. Donald Berger, KG5PFN. Wes Coleman, KF5UKF. Hal, KG5OIL. Bob Norris, and 5RLM. Bobby Kosar, KI5PVT. Christy, KI5RLZ. Mark Benson, KF5JSA. Paul Metcalf, KI5, KGY. And who's our host this morning? Dexter. Gillis. KB5, JKJ. Dexter's on the left, okay. And then Ben Gillis is sleeping. Ben Gillis, I, don't, I can't remember either. <laughs> <laughs> as long as he can, we're okay. All right, we want to thank thank the guys at Trans Volunteers. Right, thanks, Chris. <laughs> Okay, and then just uh, real quick, so this um, Michael Lambert, KI5MIK, he's mm -hmm. new. How did we get, did you pass he, this? He, uh, he dropped it off my mailbox. Okay. Okay, so he's relatively new, learning things, and uh, so we'll put him on the list uh, um, as a new member. And then Mark Benson has been, he was a, has, had been participating some years back. Looks like you got back into the fold. So welcome back. The, uh, I keep trying to get Hannah Lang to, uh, to join us by Zoom. I don't know if she'll be able to this morning. She is a night person because she is one of the two managers at the observatory out of Brass's Bend. Uh, but she recently uh, renewed her interest in ham radio and she was asking me, how can I do something from on top of the observatory with my handheld? So I told her how to do it. Get a vertical, stick it on a pole in the corner of the deck, and get a little adapter to her handheld. Like, oh, I have an adapter like that? Yes. That's a nice big deck there. It is. Nice big deck. The problem with the deck is that it's about 15 feet above the ground. And the rules of the museum now say if you're on the deck, you have to have a paid employee present with you. So we're on the grass outside of it. You've got this 20 foot tall steel and concrete structure right beside me. I kind of block and tumble the horizon for, for radio. Is there a repeater not too far from there? Uh, no. The, uh, but it's, uh, uh, we'll get in, into uh, what I did find uh, as some ideas out there in just a minute. Um, do you have your, let me know when you're ready for the treasurer's report, Mark. Okay. Now last time we had a very small group and we talked about, where did my notes go? We talk, talked a little bit about the things we were looking for in a, in a field day site. And I asked folks to look at the list that I've sent out of possible activities for the next couple of years. Some I have discarded for this year. There's just not enough time to plan for them and convince the, uh, the institution that had taught
talked about maybe they'd be interested in convincing them to actually participate. But the Museum of Natural Science is excited about having a station for uh, Astronomy Day, which is the end of October. I don't know exactly which date yet. Probably have it out at the observatory, at least to go uh, get on the air station up on the deck. We can manage that. There's power. There is a very good spot for putting up uh, a, uh, a couple of portable antennas that are, that are uh, one of them is actually, you've got the fence on the deck. It does one of these. It's got, uh, there's a big concrete pylon right in that, that indention. Nobody seems to know what it's for. Well, it'll be a great spot to put a tripod with a portable antenna in it, out of finger reach, which is always a good thing. And then uh, in, the, in the next corner down where it makes a turn on the handrail, be a good spot to lash off a, uh, a pole for a two meter antenna. We're talking maybe next year, something for Earth Day, but that would be at <coughs> the museum in Sugar Land. Pi Day next year, they're talking about they might want to have another radio demonstration because it went so well. You can pay him. Yeah, what did I do? <laughs> you should have done paperwork. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, uh, the uh, Dick is on the strand. Dom isn't here, but I'll cut, get in touch with him. There is some interest from a couple of guys in Bmark about participating in Dickens on the Strand since we're doing telegraphy. And uh, last time I spoke to Dom about it, which was December, uh, he expects to get another invitation for this year. Bless you, Bless you sir. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good one. Yeah, that was. <laughs> get them all out at once. My wife says, they're pushy, pushy, pushy. Yeah, absolutely. Done. No, get it done. Get it done. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, other general information, another note from Mike Hardwick. He says, Ralph, are you interested in having an all clubs club? Like get the presidents and vice presidents of all the clubs together in one room? Use the old uh, Houston area radio club. Yeah, we've been talking about it. We thought an invitation been sent out. He said, no, let's do it. So he's gonna send out an invitation from both clubs to uh, about a dozen other clubs that are in the Houston area, including up to Huntsville, because there are some of those guys make a regular trip down here. Yes, sir. A uh, quick uh, question or note from Richard Arvidsson online. He mentions that uh, October 9th is Astronomy Day. Just something to keep in the back of our mind to discuss with other clubs, maybe. Yeah, it, uh, the museum says they're not sure they're going to do it the 9th or the 29th. The, the official Astronomy Day, yeah, the 9th. The uh, museum of Sugar Land, or, uh, yeah, at Sugar Land is in control of George, and they're trying to figure out which date they want to use. But thank you, yeah. Thank you, Richard. Uh, let's see, these are some things. <laughs> well, we'll get done with the business here in a few minutes. Field day. Possible locations. Now, a while back, I sent out to the reflector and everybody else I could think of this table explaining what I found out there. The uh, observatory is not a good place. If we want to run overnight, we'll interfere with their uh, Saturday night observing, and we would have to pay for an employee to be there. Now, if we just did it during the day, well, we've got an employee there anyway. We might be able to get away with it. But with the domes lined up, three domes lined up on the south side, that blocks a good portion of the horizon. So I was thinking over the screen shelters, over the camping area, there's power in both areas. There are two, two uh, actually there's screen shelters and two powered camping areas, and then a more primitive area that, that uh, the scouts and other organizations use to go to, there's no power over there. When I checked, Two nights ago, there were still several screen shelters available adjacent to each other. Uh, and, I, and on the map, uh, when I do a Google Earth aerial view of it, you can see the cut in the trees where the power lines go. So we could say it, that would allow us to pick a couple of shelters away from that. You're allowed eight campers per site. 
if you have people coming and going during the day, you're not going to keep keep, keep a head count. You only have room for three vehicles at each site, but there's uh, parking nearby. And the screen shelters, they're in a little circle, so there'll be other campers in the area. It's not far from the RV camping area. And the playground, lots of public traffic that way. It'd be a good way to do outreach. And Jeremy says, and he talked to one of his troops already, they want to be out there field day over in the primitive area so they can talk back and forth with us and come over and uh, participate in field day uh, at our main station. So that is my recommendation. It's $25 a night per, per site, whether it's uh, a, uh, just trees for an overhang or uh, a screen shelter. And there are trees behind the screen shelters that would provide good access for, uh, for antennas. But plenty of green space, open space, and adjacent for portable verticals. I always put up my 20 meter vertical, what I put together, it works quite well. We proved that at the uh, uh, party for the winter field day. Yeah. Uh, now, if the club is agreeable to doing that, I can reach out and reserve it. Uh, it'd be uh, Saturday night, because we can get there like 10 o'clock Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, and we'll have it until noon. Sunday, so just Saturday night for two sites, get them as close together as I can, hopefully side by side or just across the uh, little path, and that'd be $50. If I ask the coach permission, I'll proceed on that this evening. So moved. What's Second. that? So moved. Oh, so moved, okay. Second. I mean, okay, any, so any, uh, $50 expense coming? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so, who's, so, that, so if somebody pay that, re, then I'll, I'll pay it. Uh, any uh, any objections? Raise your hand. Okay. What is the date of that? Uh, June 25 and 26 of this year. And we'll have it for overnight. We can operate overnight. Uh, as far as uh, we'll have power. And if I... I may go set up at the uh, the scouts and just run on sol solar panels and batteries to show them that that type of operation. But uh, so no generator to cause noise for for adjacent campers. We'll probably just have a couple of radios on the air overnight. Shouldn't make too much noise for anybody else. Use headphones. Uh, we can set up inside the shelter or outside under a canopy. I bought a new pop up canopy canopy just for this purpose. Uh, when they realized, I think I think they sent me a black one. I'll have to look. That might not be too good during the summer. If it is black, I'll get one of those uh, mylar blankets and throw over the top. That'll protect us from the sun. Is there? We, I think I had talked to Jeremy about um, some other expenses, whether it be food or drinks or stuff. Um, you know, if we're going to have some nominal expenses for a field day, that's a covered expense, I guess. Mm -hmm. So just everybody's okay with that. So we have sundry expenses that go along with that. Anybody object? I have no okay. objections. All right, we'll just run those as reimbursable <coughs> expenses, just so I know what's coming. Now it's $7 per person to get into the park. And that's unless you've got a park pass, then you've already paid it. You can just get on in. It, uh, I have a badge like this for uh, for the observatory. I get it for free. <laughs> so, by the way, these passes are a good deal. They you are. pay for a year. Yeah. It's right. about seventy dollars. Oh, Texas state, state parks. Park. Every state park in Texas. Yeah. So all the That's way from get. El Paso to Beaumont. It's really good. Deal. Yeah. Okay. Um, you discount campsites too. Oh, really? I haven't yeah. tried the campsites, but that's a good Yeah, because that's what I use when I go. I'm taking out the RV and stuff at the state park. Mm -hmm. You get into the park free, and you get a special rate normally for camping. Very good. Um, it's over the chair. Dom. <clears throat> yeah, Dom there's been some, some folks in the chat, and uh, let's see if we can uh, go ahead and bring up. Dom is, Dom. is this a good time to, uh, yes. to bring up some comments? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, guys, I was just waiting for Paul's here. And, uh, okay, so we have uh, 
comment about uh, okay, Dallas and historical foundation is open for a CW demo. All right, uh, that's it. Dawn, our our liaison for that. And have a get on the air station at HMNS Maine and talk to observation. That's another possibility. Well, can we check check and make sure everybody can hear? I assume they can. Uh, okay. Uh, can everybody can hear? Everybody, anybody that can't hear. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, uh, the one from down there about having uh, get on the air at the main and then something at the observatory, I think that'd probably be a good idea because Astronomy Day will probably have something happening at all three locations. That's a good idea. Okay, uh, nobody's responding, so hang on. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah. yes, here, yes, fine, Richard, hear so, okay. Uh, the other thing from Richard was uh, sometimes the rangers object to antennas in the trees, heads up. Definitely for parks on the air, you know about this. Some parks, they're really finicky about you putting anything on their trees. So bring him up, Wolf River. It will awesome depend thing. on who's there. When I, when I walked inside to talk to the rangers about uh, which sites definitely have power, I told her what we were going to be doing. And we like to, to sometimes use fishing lines to pull a clothesline up, pull up a wire antenna. Are you going to take it down? Oh yeah, we take it down. Everything disappears. We leave sites cleaner than when we get there. And uh, they're very lightweight. It's just a piece of wire. It'll probably be okay. Check when you come, when you, when you come uh, to get set up. So uh, I'll continue to uh, prime them on that. The, uh, I think if you tell me to use a clothesline uh, rope and stuff like that instead of wire, it might be a little more reactive to you because the wire's cut into the trees. Yeah. That's why I said we use fishing line to pull up a clothesline, then use that clothesline to support a piece of wire. So I'll need to sketch it out for them so they see where so that's not wire in the tree. It's a good point. So just to plug for winter field day, again, um, or regular field day, this is where you get to test out your equipment. Just grab all your batteries or operate with power and you test to make sure that you know, you're able to set up in the middle of nowhere, so it's really like a parks on the air. It's really a good, good system, a good uh, program. Yeah, but, uh, one other thing about field day this year also is I think this the the, um, the scoring is still the same as it was last year. So there's mm -hmm. still individual aggregate, you know, individual home stations can aggregate for the club score. As long as you're within a hundred miles or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That'd be, so I still think that. You know, so you don't necessarily need to be out there for that um, in order to have the score count. So mm -hmm. last year we had, I don't remember where we placed last year, but we, we weren't at the bottom. And we, I, we did aggregate the scores, so uh, that, wor that worked out okay. So just, just FYI, you can still, um, you know, aggregate your home station score for, for that. The other thing about field day is also we're stu we're scheduled to have a meeting, still scheduled to have a club meeting here for field day um, and testing. We're gonna have te testing here that day. So if there's some other plan, I haven't, I've set the schedule already, but we haven't, you know, usually I confirm the schedule the, the week of. So if there's any real heartburn with not wanting to have a meeting here, we could have the meeting at Browse's Bend or something like that. You know, just have it, people go out there or suspend the meeting for that day. Um, testing's been a little thin, as you can see right now. But, um, you know, it's just like, you know, a number of us are right here, so. Yeah, that's um, a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up. So, we have some time. We, we have the room reserved right through June, through July, actually. So, uh, but if nobody's gonna show up and we're just here for two, for two people, then there's no, there's no point in uh, having a meeting here. Yeah. At one time, uh, uh, Transtar uh, Radio stopped since it's an emergency place that we were, we, I think we actually used it here for a little bit uh, mm -hmm. on field day at one time. Right, yeah. Is there any uh, conversation just, about that? I have to get with Ben and see no, I mean, we, saying, can't we can't aggregate that score. Really? No. Even if you're using it as the club? Because we're going to be in two locations. We have that. But somebody can use their own personal. 
Okay, not so at the Mitchell right? Transfer Station. We can't aggregate that score. We can operate it for, the, we, we, we ran into that problem before, where we split the score, where we had, where we had, um, you know, uh, TRB-1 and TRB-2, and that didn't get counted. Yeah, that doesn't it, work well. Yeah, it can't, it, we can't really do that. So it's either gonna be one- You have to use your own uh, call sign. Right, yeah, we have to use our own call sign, but then we can't, then the others can't get a point. If we, if we run out of here and we call it the club, you know, we we can't, when we say we're operating from OEM, we, those those points don't count for the other, for, for us as a club station. I thought they aggregated those as an individual. No, it's not, it's not aggregated as an individual, it's completely separate. Because we, we can't, run the club station from two different locations. Um, and no, you just have, we, you'd have to use your own private score, uh, your own private uh, call sign from wherever you're at if you're not at the club lo main location. Yeah, we did that two years ago and that created a whole bunch of confusion at um, ARRL and that contributed to our score of like uh, 25 uh, that online. year, or 200. 200. Yeah, there's still uh, Richard, Don, and Mark. Yeah, uh, he was asking if anybody from uh, in the meeting okay. online. That's so the work. question is, the, the question came up is, what's the point of the contest? Okay, what's what's the point? So of the, I don't know what the contest is. Okay, yeah, so that's what it is. So the it's field not day, supposed to be. Field day is not supposed to be a contest, but it's actually a contest. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a good what you, what, so how it works is that all the stations get together for field day, you see how many contacts you can make, and then there, and then, the number of contacts and what they call multipliers are, are scored together and you get this score, okay? And it goes by the number of operators, the power, the number of contacts, the location, and all these other things that, that add to the point score. So if you're on solar power, you get, an, you get extra points. If you're on, uh, in an emergency operating, uh, center like here, you get a certain number of points. If you have members of the public attend, if you have students attend, if you have uh, sort of agency. agency participants, Red Cross, uh, Red Cross, or sheriff's uh, office, state minus uh, points for politicians. Politicians, right? <laughs> uh, you know, that kind of all these extra points for public participation. No, no. So that's what that is. That's what that so there's other con there's other kinds of contests that go on through the year, um, and uh, uh, they all have different kind of scoring categories and stuff. But field day is kind of big. What do you win? You don't win. Bragging rights. That's right. Bragging rights. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so the, the top stations, their scores, you know, like in the fifty thousand, you know, they they're running multiple stations 24 hours a day with automated logging systems and stuff like that and then there's us where we just want to score below the bottom you know above the bottom yeah not below the bottom not above the bottom yeah not below. So, <laughs> our, our, our goal is to score yeah. you know, we, we used to be much more intensive about field day but it, you know when we, we when we were at the other at our other location and you know we set up Take us half a day to set up and, yeah. and try to run, and we did pretty. You know, we had some pretty good, decent. pretty good stuff, and that and that was fun. And, uh, and what, one of these days, um, actually, what I'll do is I I was just cleaning up the uh, the club um, activities and photos section of the records, and those are kind of fun to go through to see what we see what we've done in the past, and then you know there's a few silent keys there and. Stuff like that, so that, that that's kind of cool. But anyway, so that's what the deal is. The other there's a calendar. Of, there's, there's there's also for a contest thing. There's a there's a calendar of contests. It's called eight day contest calendar, and you can go online. You just type in eight day contest. That shows up, and then it shows contest corral. Yeah, well, there was contest corral in the in the um, in the USC magazine, USC. but it's also available online. Yeah, the eight-day contest calendar just shows you what's going on right now, and it's pretty good. And um, what's 
and the about. So, but field day is the big contest for a lot of clubs, <laughs> and um, that's what it is. So the score. So in the past, you all you could do was you had to go be at a one particular location where you, where everybody operated. When COVID hit, nobody was go, nobody was going anywhere, so they changed the rules that allowed individuals operating from their home stations to aggregate their scores for the club. And they made that permanent now. You, yeah, well, at least for so far, yeah. It looks like it's going to be permanent, which I think is good. I think so, too, yeah. and, dro and drop the, the um, high power, the maximum right, yeah. power to 100 watts. It really levels the playing field. Yeah, it used to be you know unlimited power and unlimited stations, and now they've kind of made it a little bit more modest. So, um, but anyway, so that's what the that's what the deal is, and it's not supposed to be a contest. It's supposed to be like emergency preparedness and all that, but it's evolved into into some fairly dramatic uh, preparations. Some of them very dramatic, yeah. yeah so, like the Brazos Valley guys, you know, they they got man lifts with with uh, antennas on them. They're running, you know, like ten. 10 stations. I spoke to Mr. Know. Hardwick about that. He said that they, they I said, the one reason we, that we've not joined y'all or asked to is they're too intense. We like to be laid back. Well, well yeah, we did kind of get too intense, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I mean, I've been to the, to the Brazos. You know, Does their club guys. own a cherry picker? Pardon? No. They, no, no, they rent it. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the man, you know, put the antennas up in the man lift down at the park there where they operate. I mean, it may be setting up like the set, you know, you can set up 24 hours in advance. So like in 24 and one second, they're setting up for the forecast, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's those guys are- Al, you had something? Uh, I know that uh, working on that, the park the other day, one of the things that was uh, became very obvious was having uh, uh, filters. Are you going to have enough filters for uh, more than one out, one of your operations? Uh, I've got a 20 meter and a four, uh, 80 meter at home. I think I have a 40 meter also. Uh, and at one time there was a complete set from 10 meters through 80 for the club. They were in the stuff that Jim had. I don't, did you it's have? Gone. It's gone? It's gone? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I just want to bring that up as a conversation so once you know what kind of equipment and radios are going to be out there yeah. ahead of time so that that can be something addressed. We've got a good start with the uh, with the 20 and 80. I think I've got a 40. I'll, uh, I never built a 10. I'll see if I can have time to build a 10, 10 meter. The 10 when, meter has been when, fun lately. When Steve and, and Dom were working out the park, I think that was an issue uh, pretty apparent. So yeah. I wanna just bring it up early enough that, so I mean, you can each other. Yeah. yeah when when two sense. people were trying to work the same band, yeah, it was definitely a problem. Filters don't help that. Yeah, but so, even on so, the adjacent band, there was still yeah, a bunch yeah. of splash, you know. There um, was. When uh, we were over at the lodge, there were, uh, those filters made all the difference. Yeah. So I'll, I'll dig into my stash and see what I've got. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, Steve? I'm going to check with uh, Jeremy. had said that uh, he can bring uh, all the uh, cooking gear. I'll ask him if he'll coordinate food also. Uh, just yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, Dom online is mentioning uh, can bring high power two meter rig for field days. So text can work. Oh, very good. Point. And the second one also about the uh, possibility of having the meeting here and then taking the party on to field day. <coughs> have those who pass the test come to field day or an open if, invitation. If we get, yeah, if we get enough right. to. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, that would be you know that that's the typically the go that that's why I'm saying if it makes sense to have it out there, we can schedule the testing to you know, we can schedule the testing long enough in advance for there mm -hmm. and then just see what kind of response we get, you know, then we can operate. We can think about it. And it really it's, it's a very good point that we need to figure out what, what we want to do, what the best uh, response might be. Uh, okay. Um uh, <coughs> Um, the, responding to the question about what is field day, uh, I, I've been a ham for eight years and I've worked MS-150 as a ham and that was really useful getting out there and doing the two meter work off of a, a marine battery to run my go kit. But field day has been, for me, a 
a real learning experience where I learned to work the the long distance bands. <clears throat> it, I, They're definitely different, aren't they? Yes, and and there's a, there's so much to know. <laughs> I, I mean, we've gone into computerized digital communications now, and there's so many different gotchas in mm -hmm. that area. Uh, I've been trying for years to get Winlink to work on two meters, and I, I've been successful a couple times, but currently I can't figure out how to get my radio gain, or gain down. Uh, it's got so many menus, and, and the 857D, I still haven't figured that out, how to get that gain down and make mm -hmm. it work. But <clears throat> Field Day has taught me things like how to use a tuner to uh, get the antenna matched to the, the radio for that band that I want to How to play. set up an antenna, how to tune it in. Mm -hmm. There's been several times I said, hey, I made this, let's test it. So you make an antenna or make a truck stab at it, bring it out and we'll all troubleshoot it with you. So there's, yeah, I learned a great deal at Field Day over the years, a lot. There's yeah. always somebody to help out. So I've, I've collected equipment to do long distance work, but I still haven't got my antennas assembled and up uh, where I can do that. But at Field Day, I can work with guys that uh, have been doing this for years and just learn by mimicry, uh, do what they do uh, as far as calling and setting up and, and uh, everything. If you go out to our uh, club web page and on downloads, there's a PowerPoint presentation I did about this little vertical antenna that I made using uh, canopy poles. I mail over some canopy poles that snap together stainless sections and then put a stinger on top of it with a hose clamp. And I tuned it in, it's flat across the whole 20 meter band. Wow. It's only 15 feet, nine inches tall. And I hold the, at home, I hold it up with some cinder blocks on the side. When we went out to Stephen F. Austin Park, I just used some uh, uh, black uh, nylon line to, uh, as guy wire. And it worked quite well. Yeah, I've got a lot of tin stakes. I've got a lot of guy wire material. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's an idea for you. Something quick, easy to put together. I got a uh, got little presentation on how I built it and, and what the results were. Yeah, one, one other thing about field day is that if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong on field day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Have, you know, we've had times where we had connectors that didn't work, that we didn't have spares. Let the smoke you know, out of some capacitors. Yeah, we've had, you know, just you, you, you have your little, you think you got the stuff that you need and then you don't have it and then you got to go hunting around for it. And so, uh, we're we'll to work the, around. That's, right, that's the fun of it. Yeah, but it, that, that's the real sort of operating under tough conditions is really, you know, you make sure that you got all your stuff ready to go. Now, Steve goes out. And, and he does this all the time now, so his his setup is is pretty is pretty good. But unless you're running a mobile or you've got your go box already ready to go, there's always some something, something that you don't have. Are you going to stake out a poodle so if the, the, the alligators have something to nibble on? <laughs> yeah. Well, now there's going to be some Cub Scouts in the area. <laughs> <laughs> but go, going along terrible. the lines, going along the lines of what Mark is saying, even if you do this a lot. You have, neighbor's got a chihuahua that wakes us up. Even if you have a, a setup that goes portable, for that field day, when we did the field day uh, over here at the, at, um, the, VFW park, park. the VFW park, I took the VX Commander antenna, which is you know a 30 foot uh, telescoping uh, fiberglass pole. And sure enough, it's been working like a champ at, at the house, but the transportation, severed one of the you know the main lead just enough it was inside the heat shrink so it looked good from the outside but it was just not transmitting so the troubleshooting that took place there Jeremy or Mark had a jumper cable you know with a little alligator talking about alligators alligator clips and that actually saved the day so that that kind of thing even though you think you got everything going transporting this stuff and setting it up again is really a mm -hmm. it's, it's a challenge Right. There's some, yeah, and, and that's a hard, that kind of thing's a hard one to find because you have, it was working before, and now it's not working, and then you don't have your own meter, or, you know, the th you think it, it doesn't look broken, 
you know, so those that are kind of in town know this, this better than anyone. So uh, it looks fine, but it's not working, you know. So something I'd like to show um, real quick. So the, those are over here. So so field day is really uh, if, if when the apocalypse comes, you know, you're trying to, to get ready for it. That's the that's how you get ready. And then as far as the contest goes, the challenge is you know, making the contacts with thousands of people on the air and um, sometimes they can hear you, sometimes they can't. It's crowded, you know, you're calling these guys again and again, they don't hear you. And then if you're, score you're scoring for points, so there's a strategy of, well, am I gonna sit on one frequency and just call and let people come back to me? Or am I gonna ch you know, chase people that are calling from CQ or how are we gonna do it? You know, then it's noisy, so you got you know, you know you have your headphones, or you got to have logging. If somebody, are you going to log yourself, or are you going to have somebody else log? How are you going to do all of that? Yeah, so you you know you if you're if you're if you're quick with the radio, you're going to write down the write the stuff down. That's the one that's okay to share. And try to keep organized, or the, your partner <coughs> listens to you and your partner work together to make the contact. So you write, so you hear somebody on the air, let's say, you're going to make the contact, you hear his call and his exchange, you write that down real quick so that you don't, so that you're not fumbling with it. You try to make the contact, and when, you, when he confirms your contact, then you write that in your log and then um, confirm that. You know, so you kind of try to get ahead of it. Otherwise, you just you write it down. You can't make the contact. You cross it out. You move on. So, um, but you got to be pretty quick with it because you're trying. It's, it, you're, you have a sheet that looks like this, and you're writing stuff down. It's you're trying to move really quick. Um, if you don't make the contact, you don't have all everything filled out. You can lose your place. Mm -hmm. It can get very confusing. And then um, you know if you're hand logging, and so and then whoever has to transcribe it is usually me to get it up to the to, to scoring, but it's very confusing. So you know, handwriting is important, which mm -hmm. some guys are not very good with their handwriting. Um, we uh, yeah, it's like chicken, or, or I'll get these guys logs and it's like it's freaking chicken scratch. I can't read it. You think you got doctors? Yeah, I mean these guys are. That's why I was telling you. Always I, I try to make the oh, he's number two big, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is computer logging, but it's been it's a pain in the ass. So yeah. I don't use it. Um, but that's kind of that, that's kind of. There's a bunch of videos, field day videos, stuff like that. And no, here from Richard Arvison. Mark Gummy started to help me so much in learning solving. We all help each other. That's a big part of this. Uh, yeah. I'd like to draw this to a close for this meeting. We'll continue discussions uh, a little bit at a time, or maybe even have a special meeting, uh, a Zoom meeting for field day. Pre-meeting. Mark the treasurer yeah. report. So there's two things on the business side. We have the treasurer, we have the, the re receipts and disbursements, and then we have the membership. So I took this old, I took over the um, financial stuff from Rick, uh, in um, January, and uh, we have got, uh, Ricka kind of did his a little bit differently than I do it, and then just in, the way it was going is the money would go to Don, the, 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 the money would come into Don, then it would go to Rick, and then, and then I would get the, the list of people to keep up the roster. And so there was a lot of, difficulty with that um, just to keep track of it so the decision was made that whoever is doing the banking will also do the roster so that has now fallen on me and so I've got everything cleaned up from 2021 and 2022 mm -hmm. 29 paid members 22 active but not paid right yeah so we have so we have the full the full roster of basically everybody that we carried forward over the last few years. We've got 31 active members paid up until, uh, including 
the two that came in today, we have 22 that are not paid that were active from 2021. And then we have 14 that are yeah, inactive yeah. who have not paid over two years. And then there's five that are missing in action where their emails are kicked back and we haven't seen them since in, uh, in, in four years or more. So- Does that, that include the silent keys? No, does not, silent keys don't count. They're not missing in action. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, know where they are. So yep. there's a, so the only, of, of who's here, Barry is the only one that hasn't, I don't think has paid for- I have paid. Okay, then that's, then you're the one that I was missing for, uh, January, you must have paid cash. I, yes, I paid cash to Tom. Okay, so that takes that's good because there were, I was missing a I was missing a um, cash in. I was missing a credit for twenty bucks cash. Okay, so that takes care of that. All right, so this is Barry. Um, so Marky says everyone here is paid. <laughs> everyone here is paid. Cool. So let me go, Barry. Jim Sykes wants to get his hand. Who? Jim Sykes. Which? He's not here. No. Jim Stimson? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Another one. Yeah. Then Jim, Jim is. He. Okay. So he's a 20. Or, and he's good for 22. Okay. Okay. All right. So okay, so that so that's that. So anyway, as far as where we are right <coughs> now, inclu uh, not including the monies that I've just received, we have we have um, two thousand seven hundred and forty dollars and thirty three cents <coughs> in the bank now. I just paid the club insurance, which is two hundred dollars. So that should be hitting the bank account here this week. The only other than the 50 that we'll see coming up, the Zoom account is um, <coughs> going to be renewed for $159. I think Jeremy and I talked about that and I think the decision was that we're gonna go ahead and continue with the Zoom yeah. account. He and, I, he and I confirmed that. Okay, so. Uh, so that so as soon as I get that re, that notice from Jeremy, then we'll um, reimburse him. Uh, from January to so it's from January to the present, we've only had two disbursements. So that's going to be for the insurance and for the Zoom meeting and everything else is receipt. We're a little shy of our revenues compared with last year. So we have a 2022 revenue so far is $610. And so well, I'll probably send out another reminder to these others uh, of, the, of the, the remainder for their, for their dues. And typically things trickle in like, like this. Things will trickle in uh, through the year. Um, and just a matter of how much I love them. So that's kind of where we are. So this is the full membership. If somebody wants to check it, I've just checked off everybody that's here. And um, the, the other one that, actually Dexter Lewis is a, tw is a 2022 uh, member. He paid late last year, so we just carried right. it over through, um, through this year. So, yes. Uh, there's a question online from Martin uh, with the best uh, uh, call sign, XUK. He is from the UK, so yes. it's XUK. He sent off a check on the 13th and uh, for the 2022 dues, and he was just wondering, did you guys get it? That address would have been for, for you, wouldn't it, sir? The addresses that we use on the forms? Yes, but I don't remember what that name Yes, sir. No. So, on the 13th? I've got one in my office that I haven't sent in. Martin Denning. So, okay. Well, we'll, we'll check. It hasn't come to me. Martin so will check. check. We'll check. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for the, All right. for the reports. Anybody want to look at it? Any um, questions, other business? Yeah. I have one announcement. I don't know if, uh, I, 
I informed some people, but I don't remember if I informed the entire club. Carl Fisher, uh, K5 MRZ, passed away March the 5th of this year. March 5th. And I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. Carl was, uh, prior to Rick, he was the treasurer for the club. He was a founding member because he was one of the odd fellows at the lodge there. At, uh, Will you do me a favor, uh, uh, Ralph, and, uh, on uh, Tuesday night to do a silent key the way we talked about it with mm -hmm. the uh, issue his code? Thank you. Send me a reminder about what his call sign was. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll forward it. I'll send you a bill. All right, thank you. All right, uh, that's the most business type meeting we've had in quite a while. But I, I'm uh, I'm pleased with the discussion. Uh, now, one of the things now toward uh, purpose field day, something that I personally like is the outreach to the public. That's another purpose of it. But we've got uh, a couple things to share. Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, do we have a club banner we can put up at the park so people can see who we are and what we're doing? He's got it now. Yes. You got yeah, it? Yep. Bright okay. yellow with, uh, with with black lettering. Looks like a giant bumblebee. If it were purple, it could be an LSU thing, couldn't it? Yeah, we don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm ambivalent, man. I'm from Ohio. <laughs> I'm ambivalent. Uh, yeah. So we'll take it to the field. Is that kind of like coming out of the closet? Okay. I don't know. Five, ten, ten feet. feet. That's good. What's well, something that show who we are and what we're doing? Oh, exactly. Yeah, I was I'm wondering. Out, they, they don't know, and they just think we're just a bunch of guys playing around with toys. No. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, uh, for uh, 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 American Radio Relay League, ARRL, which uh, passed its 100th birthday, wasn't uh, 2014, I think it was. Uh, they put out five different magazines. They started a new one called On the Air. They got a lot of complaints about it's too, you know, I'm a new new guy and it's way up here for me. Well, they started this On the Air magazine, OTA, and if you're a member, you get access to all the publications free online. And I downloaded the April. This is typical of what they have. This is a great magazine for newbies or olders. It really is. It's got a big picture of the 10 meter band, discusses how it behaves, what the different portions of the band are, CW versus digital versus voice, who has uh, uh, privileges for each, the, there's an FM portion of it. Uh, so it's you know a very good description of it, and uh, technicians have access to all 10 meter. Plus CW, they have <coughs> with the low bands also. Uh, some of the low bands, yeah. Avoiding problems in the RF chain, RF being radio frequency. Where are the weak points where you can get leakage into or out of your system and how to find them, that kind of thing. The quest for the perfect antenna. It's a very good dis discussion about the compromises. There's no such thing as the perfect antenna except in somebody's uh, 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 hallucinogenic fueled imagination. But so every antenna we use and how good is a compromise of some sort. So it talks about that. Real good discussion. Digital multimeter, real operating reflectors, talk groups, and rooms. Well, we've got a reflector, uh, and, uh, and there's uh, at least two uh, simplex talk groups in Houston. So it's a good discussion there. How to win the toroid. The strange thing about toroids is it says, why put so many turns, say put five turns through, through the toroid? All right, so that's five times around, right? Uh-uh. It's every time you go through. So the first time you put a wire through the middle of that circle, the toroid is the circle of uh, uh, ferrite material. The first turn is when you put it through. That's one. You wrap it around and put it through again. That's two, but it's only one wrap. That confused the dickens out of me for a long time because somebody explained it. But it's a very good one. And in, uh, I think it was January, February of last year. Now, this one comes out every other month. And you can download the whole thing. 
the first issue they had building your own two meter antenna. What they did was they took an SO239 standard UHF connector, turned it upside down so that your uh, <coughs> threads are going down. Soldered a piece of wire to the center connection, says for, the, for this frequency, this frequency, this frequency, this frequency, you cut that wire this length. Then you take four pieces of wire at the screw holes, cut them this length, bend them down to 45 degrees. Stick that in a piece of PVC pipe. You've got your antenna. Just bring your, your, your coax up, screw on the bottom. And because you bend down, explained how when you bend down the radials, those four radials, that moves it from 75 ohms down to 50 ohms in PV. So you can tweak them a little bit to match it. It's a great little project. They have how to solder, those kinds of things. I highly recommend this one for all of us. Whether you've been around in it for a while or not. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just, had, just while we're talking about ARL. So for guys that are on, that are on the ARL that are members, the website has just been redone. And now it ha now it's come in with um, two-factor authentication where they change the the, the password. Um, you have to re-log in. Yeah, you got to re-log in now. Re-register to 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 get onto the AR webpage. So yeah, I discovered that myself. Yeah, I just yeah. so just to, if you haven't logged on, um, you just have to you know get back on there. And, they're making some efforts to sort of redo the redo the interface. Uh, and they, you know, they've had some new programmers come in and stuff, or try to make it a little kind of better linkage in the cleaned up the behind the scenes yeah, software a lot. Yeah. So there's it's still a couple clingy. of links that are not working well in there, but it looks like they're moving forward. Mm -hmm. So just to remind you. Well, we're talking about on the air. This is NASA on the air weekend. They're going to have it three or four times this this year celebration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16. And JSC and all of the uh, uh, NASA centers are on the air this weekend. So I sent out a, an email blast about that the other day. You make contact with them from home, you mean, or? Yeah. Uh, what bands are they on, any idea? Or? Yeah, all of them. They, yeah, they were on 20 uh, here mm -hmm. in today, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said they're gonna be on all the bands, including two meter in the, in the Houston area. Wes, are you on, involved in that? No, due to politics, uh, I am a member of seven ham radio organizations and the JSC Club is not one of them. Really? <laughs> okay. I work at JSC, I have for decades, but I'm not a member of the JSC Club. Pick your battles, I understand. Politics. <laughs> so a, we have a JSC question. politics is job one. We have a question from Richard Arvidson. I'm not sure about how to use the old FARC reflector. Could somebody just give a quick spiel on that? Or is it mainly a distribution list? Is it it you is, you have to have access to it. Access is granted by our webmaster. And you simply, uh, once you're on, you'll receive a welcome email. And you use the address it comes from as your go-to, when you're sending to the reflector at any time, is OFARC at mailman.qth, I think. Maybe? Something like that. And it goes out to everybody who has permission on that reflector. If you do not have permission or don't know, contact our webmaster, which is KG5IIR. And there's a link to my email address at the bottom of the webpage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hopefully that, that got uh, Richard's. Richard, does that help? I can't hear you, but I can see your note when it comes up. Do those guys have voice? Can they? Um, uh, they so. Okay, he says yes, thanks. We You're welcome, speakers. sir. We don't have speakers in the room, so we. Oh, oh okay. okay. But, yeah. uh, so with that, uh, now we've got some very nice videos that uh, uh, Stephen has provided us links to. I've got another one that, that I found, but it's, it's kind of long, so I'm not going to do it today. Uh, Rick, uh, Stephen, you had three videos, I think. A couple of them were only like two minutes long. Uh, yeah, right. So Anything before we go to these videos? 
Is there any other? We have any other business? No, any other old business or anything? So, Mark, do we need to do anything with the forward from the uh, web page to various people, the VP, the president, the the VE, the whoever? Not oh, yeah, it still shows this guy is president on the web page. What's that? I need a picture from you. Oh, you do? Yeah. For a moment, I thought you said you needed tribute. I was going to say no. <laughs> no, send me a picture and I'll post it on the uh, members. Uh, All right. Uh, th and then I'll get you the the um, membership list okay. so far. So. Is this a very large array of okay. public codes? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. So okay. so the so other than the I think the forwards you sent out in January. Right. So those let's just check those one more time. As far as the Zoom forwards, the Zoom account, we're still working with Jeremy on how we want to handle that. Because as, as long as it's work, as long as it's working, I don't care how it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, we're also we are in the process of kind of switching the contacts for like the bank account and uh, franchise tax and that sort of thing. So those go through the alias, uh -huh. um, but that, the, the bank account, the, we got the bank, the bank account's the important one, which is all set up right now. <coughs> franchise, ta franchise tax is gonna be paid or filed here like this week. And I just needed to talk to Rick about that, but I, that's really just a form to fill out with and send in, so it's, Okay. Really, not a big deal. There's really, there's really nothing functional about a lot of that, but we do should we should kind of clean up the aliases and make sure we know who's, who's got what, the backups and all that. And that's a something I just need to tidy up. My card works. Okay. Oh, my card my card please work. Please work. Yeah. Let's look at this. Looks like the right shape. Oh yeah. I'm gonna look at it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So we just three quick video. This one is two minutes. Went on a road trip to, to the West Coast a couple of weeks ago, uh, three weeks uh, driving and, and seeing the country. Beautiful part of the country, and one of the stops was this. This is a very large array of public codes in New Mexico. You can see there railroad tracks that actually extend in this direction and go ahead and uh, allow for the business. Were you able to get into the facility? The no, it's closed. So they can be pushed over to the building right there. Green, with green one in the background for repair. There's a, one of the lines towards it where we're standing, and the other line of the triad of the triad code is going in that direction. This is in the form of a triangle. There and there. And they're all the way back to those mountains back there. This is the access road here, which is actually part of the one of the uh, state roads. And then you see on the other side of this uh, access track, the, the other vehicles go ahead. Right there. And again, they're recessed away from the railroad tracks by estimation because they are in operational status. So as you can see, they require repair. They're probably pushed off of the railroad track. And then there we go. Note on that when they're dispersed like that, it, it, it mimics 
a very large aperture single telescope, which gives you finer resolution. There are three simple. And so, the, but when you cluster them together, like I was talking about in a lot of the aerial shots, you see them cluster together. That's so that you can see a broader area in coarser detail. Maybe you're just looking at a cloud in general. And so they cluster them together or they move them apart depending on what the study is. And we've got uh, big mobile uh, carriers, transporters, kind of like you used to see for, for uh, the NASA rockets at Canaveral, the, the big transporters. It was, uh, <clears throat> I think they said they had six trucks, four wheels each. A truck basically is an axle, four wheels each on this carrier. Then they go underneath the telescope, hydraulic up, pick it up, move it, drop it down, and then hook it back up again. How big is the span of the antenna? Uh, the beach antenna? I don't know. Beach antenna, so they're like 70 feet. Each dish is yeah, like 70 feet, yeah, yeah but yeah, as far big. as the, the area they can get across, oh, it's several nice. miles across that they have access to. I just meant beach antenna, so big. So he answered it. Yeah, yeah they're like 70 big. feet in diameter. And so the interesting thing is when we drove, this is on a plateau in New Mexico, but 2,000 feet high. And as you drive on the road, which is fairly off to the side, unless you're looking out for the, uh, the you know, the, the sign that says VLA, and you know what a VLA is, you don't cut out and exit the freeway. So we did that, and spur of the moment just went there. But as you drive over to that big cube in the background, it's a green building, it's quite large. There's another dish just ready to go, it seems. So it seems like if anything, any one of these go down, they wheel it out and they immediately start moving the other one in the other railroad tracks there. So they can they pretty much yeah. hot swap it, if you will. Yeah, there's several yeah. spares that they keep, that they keep ready to go. Hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, there were, the, the array is pretty old. <coughs> you know, they're constantly working on the things. So some of them, you know, they'll take one out of service, put the, put the other one, the spare in, and then work on the, on the old one. Yeah. And then, um, the, the building and the, and the facility is open twice a year for act, where you can actually go into the facility and go up to the to the, to the um, antennas, and that coincides with the, um, the the twice a year tour at the uh, Trinity Nuclear Site. Mm. So that's open twice a year where you can actually get the ground. Is that pretty close by? It's about Texas, yeah. fifty miles. 75 miles, something like that. That's close. On, the, on that array, yeah. are they all moving as they're being used? I mean, you know, I, I think they, 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 they track. Yeah. They track. Each, each one tilts to, to track the object as they're studying it. Right, it depends on what they're working on. Yeah. Because they, they don't need all of them at the same time, so they have several of them that are moving around. But even a subtle movement of, that they have to, in order so they stay focused on the exact same point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything's tracked in. So have you seen this on, this is, this is what, the takeaway was, you've seen this on movies or Cosmos by Carl Sagan or whatever. They, you know, they're aerial views and they look like, yeah, it's a triad, yeah, it's quite small. It's, they're large dishes to begin with, very large, and they're very distant from each other. So, cool. so they, that's, that was New Mexico, so yeah. you've been there now. That's yeah, they replaced, the control room is really kind of interesting because they show it in that movie, um, Contact, okay, and they show, show all the control panels in there. About seven or eight years ago, they replaced all of the workstations. They went to like the second generation. So they had a room full of computers that about the size of this room to control the thing. And in the second, in the in the next generation of computers that they put in, it fit all of that stuff fit onto a desk about the size of this. And then all the workstations were, you know, went from vacuum tube to you know, flat panel display. And actually, none of the astronomers are actually there. They're all in Socorro at the university and everything is run remotely. So the only guys that are there, the maintenance guys, um, you know, and the guys that are watching the, you know, watching out of the window out of the control room to make sure the equipment is, is, is working. And uh, yeah, nobody, nobody actually is there. You know, it's all cool. astronomers are everywhere, everywhere else other than there. So it's pretty interesting to go to go in and see that. You know, it's like where is it? I figured there's like 50 people there, but the math, it's like four guys, 
poor guys run run the place and everything else. They're probably well. doing hard, hardware fixes too. Yeah, they're just the, you know, the IT guys, like you know, with making sure that the that the uh, this is nothing nothing great. Connectors. So this second video, there's only three. The third one is actually a professional Rodian Schwartz, a definite, you know, how you look at SWR and what SWR is all about. This one is actually a Parks on the Air activation, and uh, it was right near Lake Tahoe, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a lake south of Reno, Nevada, on the California border. So we just crossed into Nevada. By the way, as soon as you cross from California to Nevada there, you see Harris Casino and everything because there's gambling, I guess, there. And then you keep on going and you get to this really cool state park and you can see the snow on the ground from a previous snowfall. And that, that evening, actually, they got a sprinkling of snow. So if you're ever wondering about parks on the air, definitely we can chat about it offline. It's really a good program. And uh, this is a portable station, so. State Park in Nevada. And uh, this is the station over here. But there's definitely a wooded area here and you see snow on the ground. A lot of it's melting. On the way up here, we got to see the uh, streams that are full of, uh, of melt water and uh, definitely uh, saying goodbye to, to winter. But uh, yeah, there's snow on the ground for sure. So we won't go through everything, but just the exchange, so you know, it's CQ Poda, CQ Poda, and then you identify yourself. I started doing the handwritten in a pad to log the contacts. That's your battery there, right? That's the Bioino uh, 12 amp hour. Yeah. It's bought it about two years ago and it's still going strong. Actually, did three parts on the air without having to recharge. So each part on the air is about an hour. And then at that point, you're ready to go you know, have dinner. But Thank you very much for the contact. But when did you do that? Sorry? When? How about a month ago? Yeah. So this is very similar to uh, the field line. Yeah. Yeah. Fire so oh, oh yeah, no, this, there, there were no fire sounds. There actually, California was very green this time around. So this is Nevada. Copy Victor November, but you got somebody stomped on you before. Could you come again twice, please? And the thing is, instead of taking a laptop to do your logging, one thing to consider is to take just a notepad and just write down, you know, you, your UTC, the time, the station name, and you know, their, you know, their signal report. And then later you transcribe it into your computer. It just saves a lot of weight. It's much more portable to have a pencil and paper. Copy the uh, the four four into Arizona. This one is the Wolf River coils because it doesn't rely on trees and uh, it's, it comes up in a few minutes. I copy Delta, Delta Zero Hotel Lima. So one thing that happened in this uh, outing was interesting is that they were having a contest. So everybody's doing a contest, so the bands are full. The 20 meter band was very full. And you're here doing your POTA and they're wanting to get a contest, so they're, they're gonna probably ignore you. So with the Wolf River coils or any antenna like that, that is adjustable, you can move the ring or adjust it and you get to the 40 meter band. 40 meter band had more contacts available. So it was pretty much of a, of a bust in 20 meters, but you switch over to 40 meters and then more contacts are there. So that's, that's an advantage of having not a fixed antenna, but a one that you can at least hop onto another. Copy Alpha Five Station in the market. Could you come back? You you can actually do it on on the fly just from having adjusted it before. You know that it's about two fingers from the top. I copy the Five Three, but I need your call sign. I need your call sign, please. Well, the first the first one was with no no coil at all. You just put push the ring all the way to the top, so you're not engaging the coil at all. And I know that that resonates 20 meters pretty much. No copy, no copy. 1.2 to 1. You can come to and one. call sign twice, please. One more try. And then for the 40 meters, just rough order of magnitude, and then you try and uh, 
go to the radio and see if uh, you're, it's got a nice WR meter. Right? Okay, that's good enough. Delta, is that a QSL? Uh, yeah. Well, um, you just said you're using the word for the Yeah, let, let me fast forward to that one so you can see it. 3-3-A-9, QSL. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for hanging in there. It's, it's, there's some snow on the ground here. It's Nevada. And it's, uh, it's a good day. Thank By you the way, much. Nevada Seven in Spanish three. means snow on the ground. You are dead. And the antenna over there is a little bit of oil. And I had to go to 40 meters because 20 meters was having a content. And uh, 40 meters actually gave better results. The first time on the photo with the Shigu G90 that I had to go with, uh, with the uh, 40 meters. And it worked out pretty well. And I'm using two logging on a piece of paper here on the, on the, on the notepad to avoid carrying the and somewhere along the way, I've lost my little knob for, for the Shiku, but it still works. So I need to do some troubleshooting to find out where that ended up at. Again, that's the, uh, the little server coils configured for 40 meters, which is a good thing to have the little server coils. What are the hard meter situation? So in the parks on the air program, you can't just go to Harmon Park and activate it there. Because Harmon Park is not part of the parks on the air program. Stephen of Boston is. Brazos Bend State is, parks and national parks. State parks, national parks, wildlife refuge areas are specific. So the organization the has put together a list uh, of parks in each state, and in the United States, start, starts with a K, K dash something, a four digit identifier number. Right. So, so exactly. So the park ID is what. If, if you hunt, say I'm activating the park over there in Nevada and you hear me there, you can go ahead and call and you don't have to do any paperwork at all. You'll get credit for hunting me down out because I'm gonna note your ID, or I'm sorry, your call sign, your signal strength, the UTC time that we talked, that we had the contact, and I then submit my paperwork to my administrator for, for, for our area here. And then they go ahead and say, hey, uh, you know, K5, KO5, KUF just got a, a hunt. So you get a hunter point, one point, mm -hmm. and you can get hundreds of these or whatever, how many hunts you do. And all the work goes to the activator. Mm -hmm. So as a hunter, it's a freebie. You just, That's fascinating. And the only thing you need to know is where they're at because they're usually QRP stations, not very strong. So in that sense, you want to look in the poda.app website, poda.app, and you'll see, okay, well, wh wh where are these stations? I'll say, for example, 20 meters, uh, 14044. So then you tune to there and see if you can hear them. Many you won't be able to hear, but a few you will. Have you ever had more than one person operating out of the park yes. at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do they differentiate them? Uh, well, well, they, they use their call sign. Mm -hmm. I use my call sign. He uses his call sign. Okay. Well, we were Stephen at Boston. There's a guy right across the, the, the playground area from us who was on the air same time we were. He was working 20, we were working 20. But he was working weeks, so he didn't uh, QRP, so he didn't bother us. And we did talk, we worked each other, but it's his call sign and K, whatever the oh, part number was. Plus the hyphen, I got you. Yeah. And then uh, we did our call sign for the K dash the, uh, and the park ID number. So people could get two for real easy that way. So if I were, so if I were to reach you from my home, what do you record about me? Anything besides the call sign? I record your call sign, I record the, the UTC time, of course, that we make the contact. And the frequency. And the frequency. However, Parks on the Air doesn't have to be so transactional, not like a contest in that sense. If it was a contest, we'd say, okay, buy it. Okay, next one. With us, with this, you can see some, some rat queue, essentially. Yeah, there's snow on the ground, how's the weather over there? Hey, great, you know, one guy from Bastrop, he was from Katy, he was like, yeah, that's where we came from, you know. Some other folks were visiting Texas, so we exchanged a little bit, so it's a little bit more rack chewing than a so field day if you're at a park is that you can anytime you go to a park you can activate that park so if you're already <coughs> set up with portable operations you know a battery and such do a poda while you're doing that i've no heard one. that you have to do like an environmental impact uh, 
thing before you activate a part. Is that right? No. No, but there are some extremely <coughs> sensitive areas where you have to, but not typically a state park. There are some national reserve areas uh, where if you're going to do a real expedition, you have to do an impact statement. Like Marshall Islands, uh, Bikini Atoll, some of uh, the uh, that reef out in the Pacific. There's some reef out in the Pacific that people are anxious to get, but which is basically two rocks just above uh, sea level, and you got to do an impact statement there. That's it. Yeah, I think these I think regular parks you don't have to do. No. Yeah, I think they're just pub they're already public. So the yeah. other stuff where you don't, you know, where you need authorization to to get on. I think that's the, that's the takeaway. If it's a state park, you're good to go. If it's a national yeah. park, I activated uh, Grand Canyon. First time we've been there. On the south rim, you just get off the beaten path and you know you have some hikers coming up and asking what the heck are you guys doing here. My wife is of course doing her part and, uh, and I'm over here with the operation. She's painting? Or? Uh, yeah, painting, uh, yeah, watercolor. So anyway, so so that kind of stuff. And uh, but But if you go to some of the National wildlife refuges, like there's the Atkinson Prairie Chicken at Prairie uh, National Wildlife Refuge, refuge yeah. over here, west of Katy, actually, south of Brookshire and Sydney in that area. That one, I think they say you're supposed to call ahead and then find out stuff, you know, like environmental impact. There'll be a limited area that you're that you're allowed to go into uh, for those, yeah. yeah. But that's that's why I got this little state park. Uh, membership for the year and just go to the state parks and anytime you're close to one activated and still remember N5 KWD David he and I shared duties as uh, net operators net control operators here for over a year and he and I went up no, no, no way of doing that we went up to northeast Texas in the big thicket and activated the National Wildlife Refuge yeah and back then I didn't know anything about it. I just flown for the ride, basically. It's gotten a lot bigger than I think. When David and I chatted about this, right? Because Poda Parent is a relatively recent program. I didn't know that. But uh, but they tried it, I guess, some years ago. It, it was very popular. Maybe that's when you guys went. Yeah, I think they tried it for a year, and then they, it became much more formalized. And now it's uh, it's all over. Uh, I know it was, for, it was for just one year. That's right. Yeah, and now it's all over, not just in the United States, but you know, the, the usual countries are going to be your biggest uh, activators, like Canada, the UK, but more and more there's uh, Japan. This is an, it's very big to go to the parks there or to activate or hunt Japanese stations. And uh, Peru, for example, where I was at, it started doing parks on the air, so they've activated. Yeah, it's going worldwide. They've added all of their. Uh, national parks in every one of their states. So and if you come across a park that you'd like to, a state park, national park you'd like to activate, go on the POTA, Parks on the Air webpage, and see if it has a code. If you have not, you can say, I want to activate this, please assign a code. As soon as you get it, you go and activate it, you need to have at least 10 contacts in, in that one episode, that, that one session, to count as, as having been activated. But you can get new ones assigned, new, new uh, 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 IDs assigned if you find some. Yeah, I think David probably has like a couple dozen. Yeah, it's, it's good fun. And again, it, it helps you take your stuff portable and bring it with you. Know, you have a backpack. My brother Great just stuff. achieved works all states in parts on the air. That's wow. so. <laughs> okay, so th this last one is maybe old hat for quite a few. It's what SWR is but it's actually a very good presentation from people that are not radio operators. So Rody and Schwartz are, from what I can tell, they're a, a technology company that deal with uh, network analyzers, and I think they're the ones also, into, they, they're partially into quantum computing and things like that, so very, very cutting edge stuff, but this is- My oscilloscope at work is Rody and Schwartz. Rody and Schwartz. They're definitely on the high end yeah, of very accuracy. Yeah, like a, like a notch above what Tektronix is. Yeah. Even their best stuff. Yeah. 
which very very good. And I, I stand corrected. They, these guys are not into quantum computing, but if you go to their website, if you're keen on this stuff, you can subscribe to webinars, and they'll have Zurich Instruments and people that are actually building dilution refrigerators to get to you know 4K and do uh, quantum computing and programming. There. There's only four degrees Kelvin there. What's that? Four degrees Kelvin. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Liquid nitrogen, uh, liquid hydrogen. Sorry. Uh, of temperature. So anyway, so th this is a quick one. It's 10 minutes. Hope you like it. Hello, and welcome to this presentation on understanding visual and return loss. In the short presentation, we'll discuss the technical concepts behind voltage standing wave ratio and return loss, as well as how these quantities are measured. Visual and return loss are both related to the transfer of radio frequency power, and efficient power transfer is one of the most fundamental concerns in radio frequency systems. Maximum RF power transfer occurs when the source of RF power and the load or sink of that power have impedances that are matched. In this case, all of the RF power from the source is absorbed by the load. And in most cases, this is exactly what we want. The standard impedance in the RF world is usually 50 ohms, but you'll also come across systems that use 75 ohms as a standard impedance, for example, cable television systems. So what happens if there's a mismatch or difference between the source and load impedances? In this case, the impedance mismatch causes some of the power from the source, or the forward power, to be reflected from the load back towards the source. This power is called the reflected or reverse power. We'll use the terms interchangeably in this presentation. Reflected power is almost always undesirable. There are very few cases where we would want any power reflected from the load back towards the source. So far, we've shown our impedances as purely resistive values, but in reality, every load impedance is a complex impedance consisting of both a real, resistive part and an imaginary, reactive part. A complex impedance is matched by a so-called complex conjugate, in which the sign of the imaginary part is reversed. At this point, it might be a good idea to pause for a brief refresher on impedance. Remember that an impedance C is a complex value that consists of two parts, a resistance R, which does not change with frequency, and a reactance X, which does change with frequency. Reactants can be further divided into capacitive and inductive reactants, which are, not surprisingly, usually created by capacitors and inductors. Our complex impedance has both a magnitude and a direction. It's very important to remember that because of reactants, total impedance varies by frequency. But how much does impedance vary by frequency? That depends on the load. A dummy load, for example, is usually a very resistive load that's designed to have a constant impedance over a wide frequency range. Most antennas, on the other hand, have an impedance that changes substantially by frequency. For this reason, most antennas have a specified frequency range over which they can or should be used. Note also that the impedance of an antenna in the real world is also dependent on the placement of the antenna relative to a ground plane or other nearby objects. So if we were to use our mostly resistive dummy load as a load, the level of reflected power would remain low and roughly the same even as we change the frequency from 100 megahertz to 200 megahertz, 500 megahertz, or even a gigahertz. If, however, we use our antenna as a load, the level of reflected power will be a function of frequency. In this example, at 100 MHz, the reflected power is only 4 watts. At 200 MHz, the level of reflected power goes down to less than 1 watt. But at 500 MHz, the level of reflected power is now 25 watts and increases to 50 watts at a gigahertz. Most real-world devices fall somewhere in between these two somewhat extreme cases of little impedance variation by frequency and large or irregular impedance variation by frequency. So clearly it's important that we have some way of quantifying the level of reverse or reflected power. And in most cases, we want to do this relative to the level of forward power. There are actually two different ways that this relationship is quantified. These are return loss and voltage standing wave ratio, commonly called either VSWR or VISWR. Let's start by looking at return loss. Return loss is nothing more than the difference in dB between the transmitted and reflected power. In other words, forward power minus reflected power equals return loss. For example, if our forward power is 50 dBm and our reflected power is 10 dBm, 
we have a return loss of 40 dB. Larger values for return loss mean that less power is reflected, so we usually want return loss to be as large as possible. And of course, return loss must always be a positive number, since the level of reflected power is always less than the level of forward power. Even in the case of a load that reflects 100% of the forward power, some power will be lost along the path from the source to the load and back. The other quantity used to measure or quantify the level of reflected power relative to the level of forward power is something called visoire, or voltage standing wave ratio. Here, the blue trace is the forward wave voltage, the red trace is the reflected wave voltage, and the purple trace is the combined voltage on the line. Note that the amplitudes of the forward and reverse voltage remain constant, but the amplitude of the combined voltage trace, the purple trace, rises and falls over time, creating what's referred to as a standing wave. Voltage standing wave ratio is simply the ratio of the highest to the lowest voltages in our standing wave. In this example, the peak value is 3 and the minimum value is 1, so we have a visoire of 3. Many years ago, visoire was calculated by physically measuring voltages at different points along the transmission line. But today, visoire can be automatically measured and calculated using a network analyzer. Mathematically, we calculate visoire by determining the reflection coefficient, gamma, which is a function of the load impedance, z sub l, and the source impedance, z sub zero. Don't forget that these impedances are complex, frequency-dependent values. Once we have gamma, Visoir is calculated by plugging gamma into another simple equation. We can also easily convert between Visoir and return loss. Now that we know how to calculate Visoir, let's look at what happens as Visoir increases. If the source and load impedances are matched, then Visoir is 1, and we have no reflected power. All power is absorbed by the load, and none of it is reflected back towards the source. At a Visoir of 1.5, only 4% of the total power is reflected. By the time we get to a visoire of 3, a quarter of the forward power is reflected back to the source. This is still acceptable for many applications. But the percentage of reflected power increases dramatically as visoire increases further. At a visoire of 6, only about half of the forward power is absorbed by the load, and the remainder of the forward power is reflected back to the source. At a visoire equals 10, two-thirds of the forward power is being reflected back. There are two special cases we should discuss in terms of visoire. The first of these is a short circuit. In this case, the load impedance equals zero and gamma equals minus one. In the case of an open circuit, load impedance is infinite and gamma equals one. If you plug either one or minus one into the visoire equation, you get the same result, a visoire of infinity, which means 100% of the forward power is being transmitted back towards the source. Needless to say, having 100% of the forward or transmitted power reflected back to the source is usually neither expected nor desired. Setting aside these two extreme cases, what do we do about reflected power in general? One way to minimize the level of reflected power is to place a tuning or matching network between the source and the load. The matching network consists of impedances, usually in the form of capacitance and inductance, designed such that adding this additional impedance matches the load impedance to the source impedance. In this example, we want to transform our complex load impedance to match the purely resistive 50 ohm source impedance. By selecting appropriate values in the matching network, we can change the overall load impedance to match the source impedance. Another way to reduce the level of reflected power is to reduce the level of transmitted power. This is called foldback and is primarily used in higher power sources, such as broadband amplifiers. The main application of foldback is protecting the source from high levels of reflected power, which can cause performance degradation and even permanent damage in some cases. For example, let's assume that our source has a maximum safe reflected power of 40 watts. If the level of mismatch is low, say visoire equals 1.5, then with 100 watts of forward power, only four watts will be reflected back to our source. If this war were to increase to 6, the level of reflected power of 50 watts would exceed the safe limit. By lowering transmit power down to 80 watts, then the level of reflected power now falls again within the safe limit. So let's summarize what we've learned. First, maximum RF power transfer occurs when the impedance of the source and the load are matched. 
Impedances are complex frequency dependent values, and therefore a given impedance is matched by its complex conjugate, which we get by reversing the sign of the reactance or imaginary part of the impedance. A mismatch between source and load causes some of the transmitted or forward power to be reflected by the load and returned to the source. The greater the degree of mismatch, the greater the level of reflections. We can quantify the amount of reflected power as return loss or as the voltage standing wave ratio or visoire. The conversion between these two quantities is very straightforward. Mismatch loads and reflections are not uncommon, and the two main ways of reducing reflected power are the use of matching networks and foldback. This concludes our presentation on understanding visoire and return loss. Thanks for watching. Very nice description. Yeah. I thought it was a good video. And that foldback is exactly what we were experiencing on the on the net. When the, my transmitted power kept on dwindling yeah. because my SWR was out to lunch. Mm -hmm. So the radio was trying to protect it. So we were talking about that in the breakfast. I ran into that the other day with uh, trying to work FT8. Now, 20 meters and 40 meters, I've got wire antennas, common feed point, and one coax. And both of them are tuned to down to 1.2 or better across the band. Well, on 20 meters, I was banging out. On 40 meters, my radio shut down. It took a while to figure it out. <laughs> what happened was I had forgotten that I had trimmed my antenna by pushing the tune button on my radio. A while back, I was trying to hit somebody and wanted to tune that last little bit out. And so the settings were for 20 meters, not for 40 meters. So I had to go in and undo that tune so that it would just see the antenna instead of going through the internal tuner of the radio. So, I, so the foldback was so bad on 40 meters when it was tuned strictly for 20 that it was shutting down the radio. You got you got to watch it. Yeah. Uh, I got a friend. He's uh, had, had trouble with his uh, remote antenna being so far out of SWR that the radio shuts down. So he put that nano the mm -hmm. antenna nano to the antenna. analyzer to 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 get it close, and then his radio doesn't go off to protect itself, and he can then run his the tuner on his radio. But right, and this this video actually shows it from a. When the engineers were designing this stuff, they called it the foldback. <clears throat> you know, you know, we call it you know this, this uh, backwash or you know, mismatched SWR. Different. Uh, it folds back the power into, uh, by, because the circuit is built into the radio. Right, and the only thing the radio can do is say, lower that power, or I'm going to die. You know, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. you know, my finals or whatever. Gonna get well, he, had, he has the he has the same uh, radio I do, so that as soon as it turned on, it would it would protect itself and shut down. Yeah. So he had to put the, he was using his nano though. As this free tune. As a free tune. Push and shut off. So. Yeah. So anyway, this was interesting, and it's a. By the way, if you remember from from your your your, uh, your math, the complex conjugate that's where it's used. <laughs> and every day. So you what you're that. saying is that antenna isn't real. <laughs> the antenna you put up in your yard isn't real; it's just imaginary. That's how nature like that. Yeah. Uh, HOA. Oh, is that not called the HOA that? It's just imaginary. Sure, it's the same thing. Go ahead and show them the math and say, see, it's imaginary. Yeah. <laughs> mm, my HOA has left me very much alone ever since I used my uh, the radio on my truck to call Transtar after Harvey when gas was bubbling up through the standing water in the street and sidewalk. I had a busted gas line. Yeah. They leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I play nice. I'm not being. I'm not going crazy with antennas, but well, mine leaves me alone too. Since I put a TV antenna up on top of my radio antenna. Yeah, yeah. I thought you yeah. had a flagpole. No, I got a TV antenna. I have a tiny flag on top of my antenna. But not. <laughs> my t I, I have, honestly have a TV antenna. I don't have cable. I've got, and I live in a two-story house, and so I've got t uh, the TV antenna. Then I've got these two guy wires coming off. Yeah, that's what I that's got. That's my 80, 80 meter inverted V. Yeah, that's my G5 RV holding it <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's that's what we had. So, all right. Well, very good. Those those are very nice. Thank you, David. We come to this part of the meeting for free for all. Questions, comments.
something you'd like to like to see uh, presented or hands-on at subsequent meetings? Anybody? Anything? Yes, sir. Um, I got a note from my son-in-law who works at Anthony Anderson saying they had a call for radio operators and uh, I responded to that. Okay. Uh, they had a call today or when? This was two weeks ago. Okay. And it was a, it was a broadcast uh, text manual or something. Um, so I, I replied. And I haven't heard anything back. I don't know if anybody else has heard about this. So. There's, there's, there's already there's a hospital a, net. A hospital net on Sunday nights. Yeah. I'm not sure, though, that Anderson's included in that. I don't know if they are Texas not. Children's and Memorial Hermann. According and Methodist is. Uh, and that, yeah, I think they're all. But there According was some to the people. note, um, they were just trying to get started up there running. Okay. Because there's already a group that's involved. Dave Underwood is involved in that. Yeah. Uh, there you go. They, there's a name you need, Dave Underwood. Yeah. Yeah, because you need to contact to get into that. Yeah, his, uh, Dave Underwood's Yeah, there's several nets, there's several organizations that are trying to get that done and have the hospital net. And then there, like two years ago, there was some disconnect between the, the various hospitals in terms of how they were gonna be staffed and, and operated. And so some of the hospitals are still participating and some aren't, I don't know what the, what the status of those uh, is right now. And okay, his phone number is 281-914-2700. And then his email is wd5hjv at gmail.com. wd5hjv. Hjv. So I would suggest that uh, in the uh, uh, subject line you put uh, hospital net or hospital request for radio operator, one of those, and he'll uh, he'll really pay attention to that. He's pretty quick. Okay. Alan? Yeah, has ahead. anybody here tried the, uh, uh, the the nets without without repeaters? The, the put simplex nets. Yeah, yeah. Simplex I'm on, yeah, uh, we've got a simplex net in my, uh, my corner of, of town. How far have you been able to get? Uh, the crow flies about five miles. Okay. There, uh, there's only one fellow that I've not been able to hear. And when I looked on the, on the map, uh, there is a cluster of tall buildings on the direct line between us. So we re relay messages around the, around those buildings using different operators. I had a friend of friends with, and we I, I would uh, simplex down to his place when I got up on the high highways and stuff. I catch like 20, 25 miles, but he has his two meter antenna up about. Yeah, the, uh, we've been operating as low as five watts, and my antenna is about, uh, it's 20 feet above grade, it's a J-pole, and it's five watts, we're hitting each other, uh, so we can certainly go farther. I know the one I tried, the Houston Simplex net, I was able to get, it was 10 or 12 miles. At five watts? At five, uh, well, at 20 watts. I bumped it up to 20 watts on that. But that's the reason for the simplex net is to see who can you talk to when if the repeaters happen to go down, which, you know, if we get a Hurricane Ike or Harvey in here again, it could happen. Uh, who, who's in your area you can call on for help or relay messages all the way across town. And that's speaking of that, should the unthinkable happen that field day there's a hurricane, you know, so I mean, that's up to you. I would guys. stand that park at floods. Yeah. Would? I would not. Does. So the go, no go is the day before, right? Yeah. It, uh, during Harvey, they had 10 feet of water in parts of the park. That would make the alligators very close. Yeah. Very but they're friendly right off your hand. 
Usually all the way to the elbow. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you about those alligators, several years ago, it was like 15 years ago, maybe more. <clears throat> I was out there with my telescope. I set up on a little piece of land not far from the interpreter center. And I set up after dark. I was on solid ground. I did not realize that this little piece of land stuck out into 20 acre lake. And when I turned on my flashlight around midnight to take my telescope apart, I was thinking about something about twice the size of this table. I was in the middle of that and all around me, there like six alligators just watching. <laughs> I just moved very slowly, but deliberately. Is that professional courtesy? Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you've got the telescope. I would have left without it. <laughs> uh, you make a good comment about that. If you go out to that uh, place anywhere near the telescope, guys, anybody here have headlamps, you know, right, uh, uh, yeah. for oh, white? Yeah. Do you know they all have red? You know, and that's why, because if you're around telescope guys, you'll use the red one. Right. Yeah. All right, everybody know that? Yeah. Red light does not bother your night vision. White light will destroy it. One, a one second blast of even relatively dim white light, it can, for some people, it takes as much as an hour to recover your night vision. You might pass that on to, to Jeremy and his guys, the Boy Scouts, just so they know that. Yeah. Because they're going to be out. My, my Cub Scouts, we always, so, uh, <coughs> my son and I used to always love to go for walks in the neighborhood after dark. So when he joined Cub Scouts, he said, Daddy, it's time. So we went for a walk. About two boys joined us, no flashlights. And the next night I look up, and all the boys are here, they're saying, can we go too? It's time. <laughs> so we had adult, boy, 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 adult, boy, 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 adult, and, and I had uh, these little uh, glow sticks. Every boy had a glow stick hanging around his neck. And one parent had a little, uh, had a headlamp that had a black light on it. Well, the piping on their shirts, intensely white fluorescence. So we could spot them with that black light no matter how dark it was. And we saw a rabbit and we saw a fox. <laughs> then, we saw, then, we, then we saw a, little, a miniature tank, you know, right in a can, an armadillo, <laughs> lumber along behind. Yeah, that's, that's called a fossil on a half shell. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cajun, is that dessert or dinner? Actually, our meal is very good. It's all white meat. It's tender. It's juicy. Yeah, it's greasy. Best cooked over an open fire. We'll base it with beer and butter. Pick the beer. Would you like a lot of chicken? You might have liked chicken, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so, we'd be amiss if we didn't mention the cross band uh, exercise with the military in mm. a couple weeks. Oh, that's right, so yeah. May 14th this year is the uh, Armed Forces Day crossband exercise. This is typically held a week before Armed Forces Day, uh, but this says to avoid the Dayton Hamvention date. Uh, apparently, this has been going on, I didn't realize, for yeah, 15 military. years. Yeah. And the concept, if you're not familiar, is that the military broadcasts on an adjacent band to our 60 meter band. And we listen for that, and then we talk on our band, and, and they listen the on theirs, and they and, and and they listen to us, and they talk on theirs, mm -hmm. and so they are practicing uh, interoperability, interoperability between the amateur community and the military community. The sixty meter band. On the sixty meter band, yeah. Do you have to give them your grin in case they want to lob something your way? <laughs> <laughs> No, only if you're Russian. <laughs> yeah, that's required if you're Russian. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Christy, you've been licensed for what, like six months, a year? What? Um, I forgot. I think it's been over a year. Okay. Or about a year. Somewhere Give or take, all right. Anybody shorter time than that? No? Okay. Pardon? Second, second, right? Sorry. I, I was just wondering, you know, if, if anybody was newer. License to her. That's all I was trying to find out. Uh, it'll be a year for me next month. Oh, well, congratulations. Yeah. 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 Who's got uh, the earliest license? Ben, when, you, when did you get your license? 15 years ago. Dexter? When did you get your license? When did you get your first license? Radio license. 20 years ago. Oh, okay. God. 
My brother's been licensed about 40 years. I might be the Old. Are you saying we're old? No, no. How long have you, Mark? I got my license in 69. So wow. I might have got everybody beat. I think you do. Was that back when they had hand cranes? It's August. Oh, August. August. Okay. 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 That's when okay. they did spark gas. Spark gas. <laughs> and that was too. <laughs> integrated circuits were just coming in. It was trans there was transistors. Of course. You know. But, yeah, it was. Mostly so whiskey hair. It was mostly, mostly yeah. yeah. It was, uh, I had a DX60B. It was my Chip. first radio that I built. Yeah. 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 Yeah.